Hi, I'm State Representative David Yaccarino, representing North Haven, the great town of North Haven, here with my guest uh, and co-star, co co-guest, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> Senator Paul Chicarella, and House Minority Leader Vin Candelora from North Brantford. I'm in politics, really, because uh, Vin had reached out to me 12 years ago, so I could really want to strangle you sometime, but I can never thank you enough for having the opportunity to serve the great people in North Haven and the state of Connecticut. But really, welcome, both of you. Uh, we're going to talk about, speak about our set last session of 2022, the shortest session in history, the way it fell, the dates. And we'll go over some things that we, uh, the good and bad of the session and what we're trying to do as legislators, representing all of you. So thank you all. So I'll start with the House Minority Leader, if you don't mind, Fawal. Absolutely, um, absolutely. Then as Minority Leader, I mean, you, we have a the House and Senate are quite different. It's 151 members. Um, we have about 54. Four. Um, it's a lot of members to, uh, to oversee. For the Senate, the most, the, the Republicans are 13, I believe, or 14. Yeah, we but are. The full Senate's 36. That's correct. <clears throat> so it's a, it's a job in itself. Uh, then you have to negotiate with the other side, our friends on the other side, and you want to. It is, you know, we have a great caucus. I think yeah. this past session was probably, I, I call it the session of missed opportunities. You know, the state yeah. of Connecticut has a you know roughly 3.5 billion dollar savings account, 2.8 billion going toward pensions, right. and then another 900 million dollar surplus this year. So it's about seven billion dollars of sort of excess tax money that's been taken in over the last couple of years. And um, Democrats only wanted to give back to the residents 500 million. Most of that money is going to people with children, uh, and it went for to attack tax rebate on gasoline at 25 cents. I think we had an opportunity to actually reduce the income tax for people. It was one of our proposals. It would have saved every family, regardless of whether you had children, right. upward of $750 a piece at a time when I think people really need uh, to be taxed less because they can't afford their groceries, they can't afford right. gas. And when the winter comes, they're going to have a hard time affording heating oil. And so um, Democrats, unfortunately, didn't want to take up our proposal and uh, we haven't given up and we're still pushing right. for it. And if you want to speak about that, Paul, then I'll give you my opinion. Sure. But what we want to try to do as far as the rallies and, and educating the public, what we're trying to do for them. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing. We have um, some upcoming rallies. Um, we have one in East Haven um, and, and one in Wallingford the, the next day. And, and what we are doing is educating um, all of the residents on what we could be doing different right now when it's so important to be helping the constituents of Connecticut. Um, some may say $750 isn't a lot of money, um, but when you're choosing to put gas in your tank or put food on the table, $750 starts to add up really quick. That's the low number, the $750, because it could go up to $1,000 depending on, depending on your income. And in our proposal, the House Republican and Senate Republican proposal, was also the holiday for the tax for diesel, which is many, everything is just large truckers. A lot of small mom and pops, a lot of small businesses have diesels and they're paying that high high diesel tax. We wanted to extend the, the fuel tax, the gas tax to the 31st of December, not the, the first, and also add the diesel into that. So, and also lower the sales tax, the mail tax. Our proposal was per, permanent, one to, as far as $1.2 billion taking those taxes away, the, the gas tax and the diesel tax. It was the income tax and the other taxes those are permanent, going from 5% yeah, to 4%. We were looking for structural change. Yeah. You know, our proposal was saying, okay, there's an opportunity here. We have so right. much revenue coming in. We all know what the income tax did to us in 1992 when it was implemented. Um, Connecticut never grew, the economy didn't grow, right. jobs didn't grow, and it, it really kind of strangled us. And we've gotten along, but it was a real opportunity that we could have restructured yeah. the tax code uh, for lower and middle income people and make it more competitive uh, to our sister states. And sadly, it didn't happen. You know, in 2011, when I was elected, Massachusetts lowered their income tax to one level to 5.1%. Yeah. And they've kept it at 5.1%. And they've had some of the best economies yeah, in New England. They've right. recovered their jobs. Yeah. They actually now exceed Connecticut for the per capita wealth. Yeah. Connecticut our, is no longer the wealthiest in the country. Massachusetts now is. And our proposal was not for the wealthy. It was for 75000 for a single or 175 for a couple, which fortunately a lot of people fall in that, but also lower incomes. So. Right. And it's important. Um, again, you know, we talk about that number maybe not being a lot, but when you address the diesel tax, 
um, and making it more affordable for these trucks to get from point A to point B. That's also going to be a, a, a reduction in the cost of doing business, which ultimately will go down to the consumer. Um, and if we don't, as we see now, the price is going to continue to go yeah. up. So it's a, it's a, a very well thought out plan. Um, at the end of the day, what it's going to do is make it that much more affordable for the people who need it the most right, right now. You know, I'll speak a little about the child tax credit. I, I sit in finance, Vin and I sat on it for years. Now being leadership, you really don't, you could sit in any committee, but you just, you're too busy. And you listen to the proposal and it sounds good, but it's only one year. So what happens the following year? And now, now everybody's gonna qualify for that. And I, I think that's a false, um, not a promise. It's false, I think it's a false promise in a sense, where ours was permanent, the 5% to 4% income tax, which would have helped those same families. Well, I, th I do, do think it speaks volumes. I think the, philo the philosophy, um, the budget that was put out by the governor is put out in such a way where it's gonna recapture the money to spend in the future. Yeah. So, you know, he gave a little bit of a break this year and likes right. to brag about the tax reduction, but because they're not permanent, um, it is just gonna shift right back to the same over taxation, I think, yeah. that the residents feel. And so um, we're gonna, we are certainly gonna have our work cut out for us on that. I, I will say in 2017, and we're reaping the benefits today, that's why we have the, the yeah. rainy day fund. We worked together, both parties, and we had to work together. The numbers were close. And I would say, I would think, Speaker, and you, you, you and Speaker would have a great relationship, and I would think they wanted to work with us more in the budget. The governor, and I, I get along with the governor, I, I like him personally, I think he, he did not want to work with us. And no, he, he was, was probably the first governor in my 15 years yeah. that has never worked with the other side of the aisle, right. which was disappointing. And you, you're better off, you do your best work when there's conversation right. and you, you hear differing opinions. And, and unfortunately, we have a governor that just doesn't want to put that work in and, and uh, I think wants to take the easy path right. of, of just having majority rule. So, um, you know, it's going to be tough. And, and if we see in the next cycle, which I think we're going to see is a downturn and a recession, right. the real difficult decisions are going to be made. And, and that's probably when they're going to need us again, like they did in 2017. Yeah. And we'll be there. Just that I, I, I see how well you and Matt work, Speaker Ritter work. And I think we could have done, like you said, much better, much more for the public. Well, I think it's important that we have a seat at the table as yeah. we represent con constituents just like the other side does. And we're there to be the voice. Yeah. Um, and if we don't have a seat at the table, it's not being heard. And that needs to be addressed. I'm going to just turn uh, gears real quick. I couldn't participate because I was, wasn't, I was busy that Monday, I think April 11th, but both of you played in the bipartisan uh, kickball game. It's not game. politics, but kickball game, but Democrats versus Republicans. Did you have fun? Did you enjoy it? <clears throat> Something a little lighter, and then we'll go. We're going to go to public safety next, I think. Yeah, <laughs> it was it was a, a fun game. Republicans, um, despite probably being thirty years on average older than the Democrats, we <laughs> still managed. For yourself. We still managed <laughs> to beat them. <laughs> that, yeah, <laughs> they said average. <laughs> Nicole called me. She said, "I heard you're a pretty good athlete. Will you play?" I said, "I'd love to, but I, I can't." Unfortunately, I wasn't I, able to play. I, could, um, I thought you did. No, I was. I was on I'm the sorry. team, but I, I had a surgery on my oh. foot, so. Uh, my doctor said, you're crazy if you think you're going to play kickball. But it's so. good that, you know, we do that do that as both parties to try to work together. And, and, and the, back to the point to the budget, I think we could add it for the public, for the taxpayer, we could add a much better uh, budget for the our taxpayers. Well, I think it's, it's funny that you bring that up because uh, it, the name of, of the Democratic um, team on their jerseys was what? Majority rules. Oh, was it? We were um, a stampede. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, talk Buck about Pete. just understanding uh, how they have those numbers, and, and they're not they're not afraid to to, to boast about it because it's right on their jersey. Majority rules. I know so. it's three o'clock in the morning when I'm going home. <laughs> like, but anyway, um, <clears throat> let's talk about public safety. Paul, you're you serve in public safety. I served in that committee for six years. I was so honored, and I love serving in that committee. Fire and police, uh, first responders. Um, and, and even gambling at the casinos. Um, yes, so you, to you know, talk about it, like the juvenile justice or any of the anything we've done. Sure, sure. So uh, public safety is so important, and we talk about that a lot on this show. And and anybody that follows our social media, um, we talk about how important public safety is. Uh, it's it's imperative that our constituents could go to the grocery store and feel safe. Um, and 
you know, without public safety, we talk about businesses and taxes. If someone doesn't feel safe in an area, they're not going to conduct business. And I think that public safety is at the core of a good economy. Um, and, and we tried to put forward a plan to handle this rise in the juvenile crime. Both at the House and Senate worked together, had some really great ideas and a very comprehensive plan. And between the public safety and the Judiciary Committee, um, we got some things out, but it was a small piece right. of what really needs to be done to address the issue at its root cause. You know, it's like uh, pulling a weed out and not getting rid of the root. We need to stop this from happening and continue to happen. And it needs to start with the kids at home and at school that they understand there is a consequence right. for <clears throat> actions, good or bad. Um, and, and I think some of that comprehensive plan um, that did not get looked at um, is really going to um, hinder the, the, the work that does need to get done right. to address this juvenile crime. Um, and also we need to support our police and first responders. And another big part of, a part of that is pulling back some of the things that came in before my time, just before I got in with right. the police accountability bill, um, that, that is directly correlated to this rise. And it needs to be addressed. And I hope to do that next session if I get the opportunity to represent the 34th. Yeah, just letting our, law, our first responders know that we're there for them. They want to do their job. And I, and I think they do a great job overall. And as far as the kids, I. I mean, I did stupid things when I was a kid, but I knew there was consequences. Sure. And I tell this, it's a stupid story, but it's actually really not. I got caught fishing at 15 on private property, trout fishing. And I, the owner of the property put shotguns to me in my friend's heads. We're all 15, 16 years old. And we had a, I, had a, I lost all my fishing gear. I had to go to jail for the night, got fingerprinted, had to go to court. And I learned, I scared, it really scared me. And um, nothing happened to the owner. No, it shouldn't have. We had, years later, we became friends. Actually, I bought a piece of property from him. Great guy. I was wrong. Um, you know, maybe that's, it's a different world then. I get it. But the fact is, there's still consequences. And I paid that price. I lost all my fishing gear. Sure. I had a, I was punished. I spent a part of a night in a jail cell. Now, you know, before this, what we did this year, you had m maximum six hours in prison. And you want these kids to learn a lesson because you want them to have a good life. You don't want them to stay in that perpetual a crime you want them to sure. have you we you know we want to have a good life and i don't think you're going to have that good life if you continually do that or, and they lose hope and when you lose hope it's hard to, to do anything sure sure and a big part of it was the workforce development maybe we, we could touch on on briefly but that was another big part of of the juvenile justice uh, package yeah. that we tried to put forward um but as you said you knew there was a consequence you learned from the mistake and you were able now to have a relationship with this person that you uh, unfortunately were trespassing on the property. Yeah. You know, there's officers that tell us that they arrest somebody three times in, in, in one day. Yeah. And they're released before the officer is done with their shift. Um, so that needs to be addressed. Sounds silly, but it really, really, you know, having a gun to your shotgun to you. And I'm not saying it's right, but that's the times then. And then spending some time in jail and my parents, you know, letting me have it. Um, and I was fortunate. I had good parents. I did this foolish thing, but. Sure, I was more afraid anyway. of, uh, I think, my parents or my father <laughs> than, than law enforcement, but that also talks about the consequences at home. Um, but, um, well, and I, I think that, you know, w what we saw what happened in Texas, you know, we, oh, we didn't want another tragedy like that to occur. And, w you know, with Sandy Hook, um, coming out of Sandy Hook, there were a lot of gun laws that were put in place yeah. where Connecticut has been the most restrictive. Um, but, you know, the other side of that is, you know, you hear people talk about, how did the police react properly? Did they react quick enough? Um, and that's a conversation we need to begin to start having again because the police accountability bill that was largely passed on party lines, the Democrats right. pushed it through You know, after the, uh, the death of, of George Floyd. Um, what it does now is it prevents our police officers from being able to pursue criminals right. um, and from being able to, to go in um, and make people safe. And so um, that law, I think we're gonna start right. seeing to be revisited so that you don't end up with another tragedy right. where police officers are second guessing what they can do because they're worried about personal liability and exposure. You know, in the, in the era of cell phones and everybody right. being able to record the actions of our officers, um, they are scrutinized yeah. months after a crime is committed and oftentimes they're the ones now being held more accountable right. 
than the criminals who are stealing the, the vehicles or yeah. robbing the stores and being left right out back uh, out of jail uh, and then not being being charged or the convictions are dropped. So I think that uh, it's something that Connecticut and as a nation we have to start addressing because uh, I, I don't recognize this country from when no. I was a kid. No, we did absolutely. some good some mental health bills. I think I forget the number. Five zero yeah, zero five one. zero zero one in and Senate Bill one and two. That's a really good step and a really good start. Uh, I think we need to nationally have the insurance industry get more on board, and they're federally they're trying to do it. But we've we've done some good stuff in Connecticut this past year. Um, I don't know if yeah, I think our biggest <laughs> issue right now for for mental health is really getting the practitioners in place. Right. Um, you know, training our pediatricians to help with referrals, being able to identify the mental illness in kids, the high risk behavior. Um, you know, one thing that we're seeing with these shootings, these kids that are committing the crimes are younger and younger and younger. Right. And so being able to identify uh, a mental health crisis, you know, an illness in an individual and giving them services are important. So part of that bill is putting um, social workers into the schools, every school um, to provide those right. type of services. but we've got to be able to train them and get those workers and and that's where time. we have a shortage and it is going to take time it's going to take time and um i you know i've always been a strong advocate i think we all have for police resource officers mainly for for safety but also many times an officer's trained obviously they're not psychologists psychologists psychiatrists but they'll notice changes in students and i i don't want to say who but i know somebody well that they their parents went through a divorce and uh, the, the girl wasn't feeling well. She was anxious and, and had an anxiety. And a resource officer noticed it. Took her to the counselor. They called the parents. And they really walked and worked through it. And many times they see something that we might not see yeah. or a teacher might not see for that matter. Sure. I think there's so many positives and pluses, of course, along with safety. And that's not fail safe, but it's something. Absolutely. And we're lucky <clears throat> here in North Haven right. um, that we have our resource officers. All school, uh, every school. Yeah, unfortunate. Um, and and I think it's a great idea. Uh, being a, a parent of young children, you know that's something uh, that a parent should not have to worry about right. is their child going to school. Well, uh, it's amazing to think that Democrats two years ago put bills in to try to eliminate yeah. uh, school security officers, and and now we're we're seeing you know again what's happened in Texas, and and a lot of schools are demanding you know to bring them in. Uh, in North Brantford, we actually arm our officers. So same in North um, Haven. Right. Yeah, and and you, you don't know it, and the kids love them, and they interact. And um, more towns, I think, in Connecticut, go on that route. And I think, frankly, it's the safest uh, way to protect our kids. For a few Absolutely. years in the legislature, I served on. There was a bipartisan board for uh, school resource officers. More funding, try to get more funding federally, and but it, it just went by the wayside because um, there was they lost the appetite by some people that didn't want to continue that role and I think it's vitally important you know um, I well ahead. that's a great example of, of putting politics before public safety or putting politics before your constituents you don't want to do that yeah. you cannot do no. that and all too all too often that happens we'll see bills with titles that have nothing to oh, do yeah. with the language of the bill and it's it's strictly for politics you, you know I, I was just it's funny I, today is uh, the 13th of June, the day before Flag Day. Uh, hopefully we all observe it tomorrow. But um, I was just talking, speaking to somebody today about there, there's so many, there's no, I don't think there's one negative or downside having a resource officer for the safety part, but also for the, the notice, noticing things. But unfortunately, I don't know why the stigma, there's people that don't appreciate or want them. And I would think now more than ever, you'd want more, if anything more. Mike's done a very good job in our town in North Haven along with the police commission to encourage uh, more men and women to serve. And we've we filled all the slots and uh, I'm sure there's a waiting list. You know, that is a big problem. Um, I talk to officers that talk about how many um, slots are available. Um, and now this is across every every profession. Um, but with law enforcement, it's, mm -hmm. it's quite eye-opening how many officers are retiring and the lack of oh, recruits yeah. that are coming in to take the job. Um, a law enforcement officer was a job that, that was respected. Um, and a lot of officers, and again, there's good, good and bad in every industry, a good attorney, a good doctor, there's bad attorneys, bad doctors, uh, good politicians, bad politicians. You know, for the, the action of a few to judge the, the mass majority, there are such right. consequences that we're seeing right now. Um, and the fact that 
we can't find good qualified men and women to take these positions, who is going to do this job? Um, and you know, I think it's, you talk about having uh, resource officers in schools, I think it's a great idea. Um, and, and, and when you would hear someone say that it's not, I just yeah. love to hear the logic behind not having a resource officer in the schools. And, and, and it's not only for the safety, it's the communication Right. of the officers interacting with the yeah. children. And I just think it's, it's a great idea, but we need to bring back the respect, again, I, to all professions, but especially law enforcement. I think the majority of people do respect. Unfortunately, you get the, the, the minority that doesn't or the minority do not appreciate or um, understand why it's so important to have resource officers. But I would think, I know in North Haven, I'm sure in North Haven, most people want that and respect that and appreciate it. Uh, so we did some good stuff for, for women's issues this year. Um, we, we, every year we either a dense breast bis bill, which governor, past Governor Malay vetoed many times when a former uh, minority leader with them, Ms. Claire, had put the bill in and just cover for just insurance coverage. Yeah, I think there were, there were some bills that are, that are covering um, certain procedures now right. that weren't necessarily covered before, uh, you know, reconstructive surgeries and, and things of that nature. And, and I think um, we've done a better job of working with the insurance right. industry of, um, understanding the data and and that right. at times in the long run we can save money um, yeah. you know th if we have testing up front in the Early long detection. run exactly so That's what, I'm sorry yeah no so we, we were I think successful in that arena I smiled because I I've always made the argument and I, I'm not sure if I'm right I think I am better to test up front or try to get get to the issue up front and save money and save lives. And obviously there's, there's always the concern of being a mandate. Is it the right thing to do? But when I was first selected, uh, former representative Tony D'Amelio had said to me, he said, he saw how I was voting in insurance. He said, you're fine. He said, because there are so many bills that I thought were mandates were bad, were actually great bills for, for not just women, but for people, the pop, public in general. And I would argue, and I think you feel the same way, and it, that it saves lives and saves money in the long run. And I think to your point, Ben, the insurance industry is I think starting to realize that it's better to do up front, do it up front, than pay later. Yeah, and I think bringing people into the room and having that conversation right. is important. And there are times where you know you, you could save money up front. You know, one of the areas again that I think that that the Democrats missed the boat on, like was the unemployment compensation oh, yeah. fund. Oh yeah, you brought that up. Is um, you know paying down a debt in the short term uh, in order to alleviate what could impact businesses. You know what. What we have happening right now is sort of a tsunami right. of taxes are, that are going to hit businesses because from the pandemic, we have a, a $500 million uh, deficit in our unemployment compensation fund um, that the governor is refusing to pay down and would rather have the businesses pay that bill. And uh, it's going to amount to about $400 per employee. We have that money with the ARPA funds and the money we could do. be used for that. And you know, it's, we had, the three of us run a, a chamber call last week, Chamber of Commerce, and there I noticed some of the restaurant owners in New Haven um, were saying, what about the, the trust fund? What about the unemployment trust fund? It's gonna be $300 or, or more per employee. And anybody, small or large, that has employees, most likely we're gonna have to pay that uh, per, per employee. Yeah, that's Not right. Not for, for, for the year, but. A lot of people don't realize that the unemployment fund is paid for by businesses, yeah. not by tax dollars. No. And that fund was overutilized because of COVID right. and the pandemic by no fault of the businesses. Exactly. Um, but they're going to have to foot that bill now. So it's something that we continue to push for because I think yeah. um, it's going to slow our recovery. It slowed it in 2008. It slowed it in 2003. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if we don't learn from history, we're doomed to repeat it. We still haven't recovered the jobs in 2008. No. And uh, if a recession is coming on the horizon, it's just going to be that much worse. No. You know, and I got to give the House credit. There was some really bad labor bills um, that we couldn't stop in the Senate. And, you know, it's just common sense. The businesses create jobs. Um, they, they help um, contribute to the, the, the revenue growth of a, a town. Um, they sponsor little league teams. You know, businesses are really the fabric of these communities. And all too often, they're at the they have the target on their back to, yeah. to kind of pay um, more and 
there was some very, very bad bills for businesses that came out of labor. Talking about the unemployment fund, there yeah. was a bill that would allow um, a small business, not a unionized business, maybe a, a, a baseball card store or a collectible store that only had four employees. If two employees decided that they had a dispute with you, the owner, they could go on strike, collect unemployment, and the business owner would have to hold their job, right. pay them unemployment, I and that just goes right after the small business that is already struggling. And you guys did a great job of stopping that or not getting that called because that could have been so detrimental to businesses and they're already struggling so much. That goes to my point earlier. And we do work together well. And I think with then as leader of the House Republicans and the minority leader, just your, your respect you've, you've earned, I think that they realize that some of these bills are just detrimental to businesses. We only have a couple minutes left, but the predictive scheduling bill for restaurants, sure. they could never, ever meet that criteria because you, it's just so, it's such a unique business. And to have a predictive schedule, you're just gonna have restaurants not hire people and they're having a hard enough time with, with, with employees. Well, and it's funny, what that bill would have done for predictive scheduling is basically pay pe you have to pay people double time yeah. if you don't give them a week's ad advance notice of when you were going to schedule them into work. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, my business, the irony right now is about 20% of my employees are calling in on a weekend and I've got to find somebody else right. to, to work. Um, and they voluntarily will come in and work. This would require me to pay them double yeah. time. And with the way the workforce is right now, it, it's only going to exacerbate the problem. Yeah. So I think you know, Connecticut needs to really focus in the reality. And it's part of the yeah. problem right now, I don't think, um, you know, the government likes to tout all the money we have in the bank account, but if they're not in the, the private sector um, working, they don't appreciate how bad things are. They're struggling. Man. And they don't respond to yeah. it. And, and that's what government needs to do a better job, is responding to the here and now. We have to wrap it up in a couple minutes, but you know, our job as legislators is to, is to listen, so feel free free to reach out to us in either North Brantford, North Haven, North Haven, or you, if you do, we tape the show in East Haven or, or Wallingford or Durham. And it's such an honor to, to serve. And it's really, I can never thank you enough. Obviously I've said he looks at like, <laughs> and, uh, but it's really serving the people in North Haven. But we got another minute or so. Well, we all like the Yankees. Do you like the Yankees? Absolutely. They're playing great. Um, I, I wish Major League Baseball would not outsource their helmets to China. I think that's going to be a huge mistake if they do that. I'm very disappointed. But besides that, the Yankees are playing great. The Mets are playing good. And uh, just for the families, so, enjoy your summer. Be good to each other. Be kind. Uh, feel, free, feel free to reach out to us. Senator Chickerell and I do office hours. We'll probably take the summer off. But we're always around, all three of us. Um, do I have any closing comments? or? No, I think just, you know, go Yankees. Go Hopefully Yankees. we'll... Well, uh, you know, we're gearing up into the election season now, and hopefully um, the, the session will be yeah. quiet. But I'd like to really go back in the session yeah. and provide some more tax relief for the residents. That's not, we really owe the, 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 the folks that, that revenue. We do. It's their money. It's not our money. It's their money. Absolutely. Well. I couldn't agree more. Um, and, and I'm hoping that we could continue to serve the, the districts we represent and uh, all the kids that are graduating and all the, the, the baseball and sports that are ending. Just wish everybody a happy and healthy summer and look forward to seeing everybody soon. Yep, thank you. Don't forget the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts too. Thank you so much.